1 Peter chapter 4 is where we'll be at this morning. We are going to be wrapping up our series through 1 Peter. So however you engage with Scripture, I encourage you to find 1 Peter chapter 4. Our direction this week reminded me of of two specific pictures. The first picture is a picture of a candy bowl. And oftentimes when we engage with scripture, we want to sift through stuff to find exactly kind of what we're looking for or what we're really hoping to look for. So we sift through it to, to kind of rid ourselves of the hard stuff or the difficult stuff or the awkward stuff to pick the stuff that we really, really want to talk about or to read about. Um, So I found this meme and I thought it was really good when people only pick out the parts of the Bible that they want to hear. None of us want to hear that because I am a follower of Jesus, more than likely I am going to have to suffer because of my faith. This is not one of the candies that we would pick out of the bowl and say, yes, more of this, please. But it's all throughout 1 Peter. This idea of suffering because I am an all-in fully committed believer and follower of Jesus Christ. Because I am in the light, wearing the light, pursuing the light, darkness is going to combat at me in any way possible. And First Peter gives us hope and encouragement and direction for how to be aware, not avoid, but be aware and to attack the suffering that comes our way because of our faith. But oftentimes we, we, we don't get there. Oftentimes we are like this second picture where we think of our Christian faith as eh, good enough. So we are on the philosophy side of mediocrities where we're just like, eh, it's okay, it's good enough. And oftentimes we land there. But Jesus calls us deeper. Jesus says, if you want to have anything to do with me and my kingdom and my reign, you must be complete. Sermon on the Mount type of language. Just as my heavenly father is complete. So we we, we pay attention to the candy bowl. We pay attention to our tendency to kind of slide into mediocrity when it comes to our faith. But first Peter will not let us stay there. First Peter won't let us land there. First Peter is calling us to a higher and deeper faith. And a part of that is this difficult word, suffer, or suffering. The verb suffer occurs 19 times in this short letter. The next closest is the much longer book called Hebrews. The noun suffering occurs seven times in First Peter. Again, when a biblical author goes out of the way to repeat a word or a phrase over and over again, you think the biblical author wants us to pay attention to something. Second Timothy comes in second with five occurrences of the noun suffering. And what I must stress is Peter was not a sadist. He was not looking for nor encouraging his readers to pursue martyrdom. He was not encouraging nor like kind of directing followers of Jesus to go after suffering, to chase after and pursue suffering. He was a realist. He understood that when you put on light, when you choose to go after the light, darkness doesn't want it. Darkness is going to fight against it. He was a realist. And I hope that we will, after this sermon this morning, I hope that we will all be able to kind of see that this morning. That when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, as Jesus told his earliest followers, if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross and follow me. Bearing a cross was not pleasant Bearing a cross meant beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you choose to follow Jesus and take up your cross daily, that is going to lead to some sort of suffering. Peter was a realist. And this is hard for us to hear. We don't like to suffer. None of us are like, yes, please, suffering for me. I would like more of it. None of us want to. We live in a time and have lived in an era of history where we work, where we pay, where we train, 
and condition ourselves to avoid pain. We avoid hardships. We avoid discomfort. We avoid inconvenience. And definitely, we avoid suffering at all costs. But we weigh that. We weigh that cultural and the media influence against what Peter has to say like this from First Peter. So as we dive into this very difficult but necessary section in First Peter, let's pray together. Father, for the ways that you have been at work this morning in this service, thank you. Thank you for the songs. Thank you for the direction and the, the, the attitude and the mindset and the heart set um, that they offer each one of us. Thank you for time and communion where we remember and where we celebrate all that Jesus did on the cross. Thank you, Father, for raising him from the dead. And thank you, Father, for all that you are continuing to do in and through Jesus in our lives. And Father, thank you for the words of, per, of First Peter. We pray for eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart that is open and ready to receive. And Father, wherever we may be at in our life with you or just in life in general, help us to apply what we need to apply in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. First Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because those who have suffered in their bodies are done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. We humans have a fatal tendency to try to adjust the truth to fit our desires rather than adjusting our desires to fit the truth. What we have here in 1 Peter 4 is action language and we have adjustment language. Arming yourselves with a certain perspective, specifically someone's perspective, someone's attitude. Arming yourselves with the attitude of Jesus. Peter is very direct here about the perspective and the heart attitude, the mind attitude that followers of Jesus are to have as we go about our daily lives we pay attention to how Christ suffered. We pay attention to the cross. We pay attention to Gethsemane. We pay attention to all of that. Christ suffered in his body. Peter says, arm yourselves with the same attitude. Prepare yourself with what may come your way. So Jesus spent much of his life in preparation for the cross and for resurrection, but also preparing his disciples to carry on what he started within his own ministry, preparing them for what was to come. But in order to know Jesus' attitude, one needs to know Jesus, specifically about suffering. Check out an episode in Peter's life that I am confident he did not forget. Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. Language that we are somewhat familiar with. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. Be you get that? Suffer many things. Be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and after three days, rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, if you just stop for just a moment and just let that sink in. 
the ego and the audacity that Peter had that like, you know what? I'm going to correct God in the flesh about what is about to happen. I know enough. I'm smart enough. I'm intelligent enough. I know what's going on enough that I am going to correct Jesus and his interpretation about what is about to happen. Unfortunately, some of us still have that same attitude that we're somehow going to correct Jesus or we're going to correct God. How many of us have ever heard somebody say or say to ourselves, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a conversation with God? (laughs) No, you're not. (laughs) You might as well swallow that ego and just let it go out the other end because you are not going to correct God or have a conversation with God with that type of attitude. It ain't happening. Jesus turned and he looked at his disciples And he rebuked Peter. Get in line, Peter. Some of us need to have that same awakening. Get in line, Michael. Who is leading this? You, me, or Jesus? Get behind me, Satan, he said. You know he didn't forget that. You know he didn't forget that. It's one of those lines that you know cut to his heart because Peter loved Jesus. Somewhere deep inside of him, Peter really, really believed that he would give his life for Jesus, and he eventually did. If Christian history, folklore, whatever you want to call it, is true about how Peter died, he died upside down because he wasn't worthy to die just like Jesus. If that's true at all, you know Peter eventually got it. He let Jesus lead. He let Jesus out in front. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus told Peter. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he said, Whoever wants to be my disciple, my student, if you want to follow after me, you must deny yourself, must deny themselves. And take up their cross that would be about suffering and follow me. 1 Peter chapter 4 beginning in verse 12. Beloved, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you. As though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. And then here is Peter, so that. So that you may be overjoyed when his glory is apocalypsed. When his glory is revealed. The Greek word here, which I don't very often put up Greek words because, I mean... It's okay, just just don't do it very often. But this one's kind of fun and I think necessary. The fiery ordeal, the fiery trial is this word porosis, where we get our English word purify from. This is a metal working metaphor, which adds the weight of clarity and understanding to statements like we read last week of 1 Peter 5, verses 10 and 11. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, after you have been purified for a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. This purifying process that Peter points to about suffering for being a follower of Jesus is meant to test us. That may be hard for some of us to hear, but it's meant to test us. Peter doesn't, he doesn't brush it under the rug. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He says this fiery trial, this purifying process that you're going through because of your faith or because you choose to stay in your faith as you go through hard times, it's meant to purify you. It is meant to test you, to see what you are made of. 
And maybe this video of the carrot and the egg and the coffee bean will help. Go ahead, press play. A young woman visits her mother and, her eyes brimming with tears, tells her how difficult her life currently is. As soon as she overcomes one obstacle, another arises. She feels hopeless, tired, and she feels like she can't continue to struggle like she has been. Without saying a word, her mother took her by the hand and sat her down at the kitchen table. She then put three pots of water on the stove. In the first, she put carrots. In the second, eggs and in the third, coffee beans. She let them boil in the water, still without saying a word. After about 20 minutes, she turned off the burners. She fished out the carrots and the eggs and put them into a bowl and ladled out some of the coffee. Then she turned to her confused daughter and asked her what she saw. Carrots, eggs, and coffee, her daughter replied. Her mother brought her closer to the bowls and asked her to feel the carrots. They were soft and mushy. Then she asked her daughter to take an egg and break it. The egg was hard-boiled inside. Finally, her mother asked her to take a sip of the coffee. The daughter smiled as she brought the mug to her lips, savoring the aroma and the rich taste of the coffee. What does it mean, mother? She finally asked. Her mother explained that the carrots, eggs, and coffee had each reacted differently when they faced the same adversity, the boiling water. The carrot went in strong, firm, and unrelenting, but wilted when subjected to the boiling water, becoming soft and weak. The egg started out fragile, a thin shell protecting its liquid interior, but became hardened by the heat. The coffee beans were unique. They were not drastically changed, but they transformed the boiling water instead. Which are you? the mother asked her daughter. When you're facing adversity, are you a carrot, an egg, or a coffee bean? Take a moment to ask yourself this question. Are you the carrot that seems strong, but with pain and adversity wilts and becomes soft and loses strength? Are you the egg that starts with a malleable heart, but with trial and adversity becomes hardened and stiff? Does your shell look the same, but inside do you carry a stiff spirit and a hardened heart? Or are you like the coffee bean, changing the very circumstance that brings the challenge? When things are at their worst, do you become even better and change the situation around you? Don't let adversity change you for the worst. Change the challenging situation for the better. Peter knows this full well. If you pay attention to the end of the gospel, specifically Luke chapter 22, Peter and Judas are two main characters in how each one reacts and responds to their own fiery ordeal are examples for us in how we choose to react and to respond to our own fiery tests. This clip from The Chosen that we're about to watch is about Judas, And mind you, we don't know how Judas came to Jesus. Judas is just mentioned in the list of the earliest followers of Jesus. But this video is absolutely haunting of how it kind of foreshadows a very difficult question that Judas is going to have to answer. So go ahead and press play. Okay, everyone. So, I'm Judas of Keriot. Shalom, Judas. Shalom. I saw you before I stepped out to talk to the people. And then I noticed you listening very intently during my sermon. That's wonderful. Thank you. And then Nathaniel briefly told me how you gave us help and how you might be interested in joining us. He's not easy to impress. Ah. I attended Bet Midrash, but my father passed away before I could pursue a rabbi, so I stayed home to work. I would like to follow you. You would? Very much. I may not be a soldier in battle, but I have business and financial skills that I would like to use to spread the, this ministry far and wide as fast as possible. I, I did attend the Bet Midrash, and I... <laughs> I heard you the first time. 
I do not require that of my followers. You would actually be one of the few. I only require what other rabbis do. That you seek to be like me. Of course. But that will be much more difficult with me than with other rabbis, I can assure you. Are you ready to do hard things? I believe you are going to change the world. And I want to be a part of that. I'm willing to make sacrifices. And I have. I am accustomed to loss. So yes. Yes. I am ready to do hard things. I want to see. Are you ready to do hard things? All of us have and or eventually will experience life purifying moments and times that will make us or they will break us. These moments will reveal and expose us. And how we are in process of arming ourselves will make a huge difference in how we react and how we respond to those moments in life. Far, far too often we try to use God to change our circumstances while God is using our circumstances to change us. So two ways of looking at suffering according to Peter. First one comes from followers of Jesus living and speaking the Jesus way in a world that is resistant and even hostile to the Jesus way. The values and ethics of Jesus that we refuse to compromise even while remaining in Jesus when suffering in life occurs sickness, tragedies in life that we did not sign up for nor cause ourselves to happen. This is 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Finally, all of y'all, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. You want to know how you can arm yourselves? Just take these on. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this y'all were called. And then there's Peter, so that. So that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever among you would love life and see good days. Any of us in this room would like to have that be a part of our life? Any of us would like to love life and see good days? Here's one way of arming yourselves. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. You notice the context of, the, of that verse? It's in the midst of suffering. It's in the midst of hardship. It's in the midst where it would be really, really easy to repay evil with evil. Really, really easy to give insult that insult has come your way. 
really, really easy to respond with the same attitude, the same aggression, the same whatever is built up inside of you at them, lashing out at them. Peter says there's a better way of arming yourself. There's a better way of going about it. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. I love this quote from Thomas Sowell. You can't stop people from saying bad things about you. All you can do is make them liars. Rise team, y'all can join me up here, please. The second suffering theme that we get out of 1 Peter is this. Suffering that comes from the ways of the world as results of living according to the world. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 3. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Folks are surprised that you know that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. Something for many of us to remember. Our pasts, your past, does not have to be your prison, but it should be your classroom. The truth of verse 4 is haunting, and many of us can attest to this. Verse 4, that these people are surprised that you do not join them anymore in their reckless, wild living and they heap abuse on you. Some of us know that full well when we chose Jesus in his way instead of our friends or this group that we were with in their way, where we said, you know what, the Jesus way is better. Even if I have suffering, even if I get abuse, even if I'm mistreated, even if I'm lied to, lied against, whatever it may be, the Jesus way is better. So church, stand with me as we close out our study of 1 Peter. going to read verses 7 through 11 as a way of drawing us into our final song. After I read, we're going to pray. And if you would, after our song, if you would like to receive prayers from your church family here, please come down and see me. Our shepherds and we have a lady prayer warrior will be out beside uh, our prayer room if you would like to, to receive prayer there. But what I love about how verse 7 begins, the end of all things is near. To which some of us would look at Peter and say, really? It's been 2,000 years. We're still echoing out of this, the end of all things is near type of thing. But the word there for end is telos. The goal of all things is near. We have been and we're continuing to live in the end times. But God's goal, God's direction is still on its way. So we keep God's goal in mind of the return of Jesus, the ushering in of the new heavens and the new earth, what Revelation 21 points towards. The end of all things is near. So because of that, we will be alert and we will have a self-controlled mind. We will have a sober mind so that we all may pray. Above all, suffering, not suffering. Above all, whatever we go through in life, as a church, we commit to love each other deeply. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. We commit and we choose to offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Some of us can do the hospitality. Some of us need to work on the not so much of grumbling about it. But this is the direction that we go. We love one another. We offer hospitality one another. Each of us should use whatever gift we have received to serve others 
as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If we speak, we do so as one who speaks the very words of God, which should make some of us pause before we speak a little bit more often. If we serve, we should do so with the strength that God provides. And then there's Peter, so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray together. Father, for this letter of 1 Peter, we thank you. For the words, for the challenge, for the direction that Peter gives us as he followed in the footsteps of Jesus. God, may we choose to do the same thing. Whether it cost us suffering, whether it cost us friendships, whether it cost us our ego, whether it cost us whatever it may cost us, Father, may we be willing to take up our cross of suffering and follow you. If suffering is because of an illness or because of something that was outside of our control, God, help us, empower us through your spirit to remain in Jesus as we go through the suffering. And may we know and may we see and understand that Jesus is right along suffering with us. God, each one of us in this room desires to be committed to you each and every single hour of each and every single day that you gift us with. Please help us to do this. We desire to be a light in this dark world to your glory and for our good and for the good of everyone that you place in our life. And God, if it means we must suffer, help us to be fully committed to you. Come what may. In the name of Jesus, we pray and give thanks. And all who agree, say with me. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together.